Thank you, Derek, for inviting me to this TED-style presentation, which I have no idea what that meant. <laughs> Made me nervous as heck. Uh, then he told me that there would be an online viewing platform, and I thought, oh my god, millions of people will be watching this. What will I say? So I've got eight minutes to give you what I generally say in about 28 minutes, so I will talk fast and try to get through this. I think for many of you in this audience, none of this will be a surprise. I hope, though, that I will be able to impart some knowledge about how to work with this with Latino Americans, especially as it relates to uh, the outdoors. Now, I'm sure that nobody in here has been living under a rock or in a cave, so you're probably familiar with all these statistics. But just in case there isn't somebody in there, there is somebody in here who has not or does not believe that Latinos in the United States are growing. We have a 167% increase in population, and by 2050, we're taken over. We are, all, we're just taken over. Uh, for those of you that don't know that we actually have money to buy, 1.5 trillion in buying power. So we're here and we have money. Our cities are changing. They're changing all over. In fact, the whole majority, minority, majority market discussion needs to probably just stop in a lot of places. If you look at the big cities, um, the ones on the screen behind me, you see that this shift of minority, majority happened a long time ago. And so if it's, uh, we need to be reacting to it because it's growing very quickly. And as I mentioned, Latinos are 167%, Asian 142%. But when I show this one, I always like to focus people on the little tiny dot. You see that little one up there? Plus 1%. That's the growth of the white non-Hispanic population. So I, if you're from a business perspective, forget about all the other things. Just from a business perspective, and I'm going to come back to that. This is important. So a lot of corporate brands and a lot of organizations are moving from taking notice to taking action. And they should, because if they want to stay relevant, they've got to do that. Now, for those in the outdoor business that are still wondering, we as Latinos, we look at the outdoors, and if you think, you know, do they actually go to the outdoors? Is this something they're interested in? I mean, it's not very pretty. It's green, it's cold, it's ugly. Right? Why would Latinos want to go to these places that are wet? Well, they do. And they go in droves. Hundreds of thousands, millions. We love the outdoors. We love to use the outdoors. We just need to be invited. We need to know where to go. We, know, we need to know how to experience it. But it's happening. It's happening all around the country. And, it's, and, and if you don't know from a use perspective or because you don't see the traffic, just look at the statistics as it relates to spending. I love this, this one right here. We're up 73% in spending on outdoors, 73% from Hispanics. And I always love to point this one out. Again, it's the little dot. Minus 9% from non-Hispanics? So from a business point of view, okay? This is about business, right? You've gotta be in the space. We experience the outdoors a little differently, though. The Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation did this great report where they went out and they talked about how do Latinos experience the outdoors? We need to get them out boating and fishing more. So they talked to folks, both uh, non-Hispanic whites and Hispanics, and said, well, what about when it comes to relaxation? And then you know, non-Hispanics would say, we like to eliminate stress and feel at peace when it comes to experiencing the outdoors. Well, for Hispanics, we just like to get out there to be the person you want to be, is what we hear. Or escape, where the typical uh, interviewee that was non-Hispanic said, it's a way for us to get away from the hustle and the bustle. Well, with Hispanics, it's not really about that. It's about getting to the outdoors and escaping so they can get back to a pace of life. And then the quality time is an important one because non-Hispanics said they want to make a connection with others, with other people. They want to meet other people when they're out there and that quality time is important. With Latinos, it's about we want to bring the family together. We want to spend more time as family when we're in the outdoors. So how do you move to the next, what do you do? It's not easy, but the payoff, it's big, 
and it's required to stay relevant in the future. Again, we're, talk, we're not talking about affirmative action. We're not talking about uh, increasing diversity for the sake of, re, of increasing diversity. We're talking about a business argument here. These guys learned it. Walt Disney World has learned it. You know, if you looked at their ads 15, 20 years ago and you start to look at that stuff now, it's not, I'm not talking about the Spanish language work. I'm talking about the English language work. Because, you know, the family that they show in their ads, that's the Rodriguez family. And mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, they're in the ads in English. So they've realized that the market is growing. It's not just about language. It's also about culture. And they've grown their market. As I mentioned, the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation has done a great project. And the Boy Scouts of America, this dwindling, dwindling membership for the last 30 years, 40 years, they've been going down and they realize as a youth serving organization to remain relevant, they have to reach out to Latinos. So how did they do that? We helped them and they're turning the numbers around. And they're turning the numbers around because it wasn't just about creating materials that were relevant. We talked to them about three different things that were very important that they needed to change. One was to look at the program, adapt the program, not change it. The core principles were important to maintain getting outdoors, the values that are imparted, learning good civic skills, but the kind of program that brought people in needed to be adapted a little bit for the Latino market. They needed to hire staff and leadership. That's the most important first step. If you don't have the infrastructure in place, you can't invite people to come. And then communicate in a culturally competent way. So those three changes started to happen. The thing that we're involved in as an advertising agency is in creating that communication that's culturally relevant. So we work with their agency, uh, their English language agency, a general market agency, and said, we've got to do something that really resonates with the parents. Because the parents are the ones that will enroll those little kids in the, in the scouting program. And the whole approach we took was, we're preparing your kids to be, to be successful in the future. So we came up with a specific tagline. And while we were filming the ads, we did something very different. Instead of taking the approach that described some of the programs they were doing and talking to moms about a hectic lifestyle and choosing which programs to do, our ads were focused on, we prepare your kids to become whatever they want to be in the future. Whether that's a president, an astronaut, or a CEO, that's what this program helps you do. So that value proposition was something we did with our ads. But it's obviously, again, not just about communicating in that culturally relevant way. It's making sure that that program is adapted and making sure that you have the right people. So in Los Angeles, for example, we worked and we found a model that was working perfectly. This guy was taking our programs. He was using the communications materials. Romy Vasquez. Romy was born in Tijuana, Mexico. Okay, so he was born in Mexico but raised in South Central LA. He was raised in an area where I taught elementary school uh, years ago. And Romy now has, is a scoutmaster in that area. So he's using the materials that we've now given to him so that he can communicate in a culturally relevant way. He himself knows how to speak to that audience. And he's adapted the programs. So he's figured out a way to integrate soccer where required. He's figured out ways to integrate the family to meetings. He's figured out ways that when they go camping, he gets the parents comfortable with letting their child go away for a weekend. A whole entire adaptation process that needed to happen. And he's got almost 20 Eagle Scouts that he's created out of South Central LA. That's a huge success story for this guy. So, what do you got to do? You've got to go where they are. And go where they are is also about the delivery platforms. And I know the millennial discussion that preceded me was about the, the digital platforms. And so I want to just make that one note because that's the kind of work that we do is very digitally focused in addition to the broadcast work that we do, very digital. And I want to leave you with this important point. Also, Latinos are online. In fact, we over-index with our use of online our time online, our viewing online, and smartphones. In fact, that's our primary, for many of us, it's our primary device for accessing the internet and consuming, cons and consuming content. 
We also create, uh, in addition to working with corporate brands, we do work for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I thought that would be relevant to share with you the kind of work that we do with NHTSA to prevent texting and driving, drinking and driving, using your seatbelt, those kinds of campaigns. Again, very focused on the millennial population, but also very focused on the cross-cultural populations as the country becomes more diverse. So we're ahead of the curve when it comes to digital, but also all of our campaigns, like I mentioned with, with the Disney work, needs to start by leading with cross-cultural insights and using that digital work. So we realized, again, going back to the guy who preceded me talking about millennials and also the generation below that they are online and they are influenced by people online. So in addition to creating this beautiful work that aired on television and on the radio stuff, we went online and we started working with YouTube influencers. And the first campaign that we did for texting and driving was a campaign with a couple of guys called Rhett and Link. I won't play the audio for this, but we're up to almost six million views by using Rhett and Link giving them the license to communicate in an authentic way, because I keep hearing the word authentic today, which is excellent. We create these campaigns and this work. That's definitely not the video. <laughs> I love the sound effects though, thanks guys. All right, by creating this kind of culturally relevant, authentic, authentic uh, approach to reaching this segment of the population, we're communicating to them and starting a conversation online and engaging with them online. We did that with Vine as well, where we're, we, we identified the top influencers. These are people that have millions and millions of subscribers and fans that are watching them every single minute, not every single week, once an hour, one hour a week. These are every minute, these Vines. So we did the same thing. We worked with 20 influencers of Vine to create seven second videos and get, again, get a discussion going online. We did it in English, we did it in Spanish because again, we're on that platform, that digital delivery platform. And what we were really surprised to find is that one week in Ad Week, they ranked us number four in viral videos. Number four, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, number four, do you know what that means? That's huge because look at who is number one, two, and three. Samsung, Adidas, and Nike. So to be a government agency and to be number four was great. In August, we did a campaign with the Fine Brothers. How many of you know the Fine Brothers? Of course, nobody in here. Oh, you know the Fine Brothers. There we go. So we have the Fine Brothers, another influencer in, in YouTube. I didn't know who these guys were. And uh, again, we ask who we want to reach. Who's influencing you? And we heard the Fine Brothers, and we did something with them. That went to number three in the YouTube leaderboard. So. Again, this kind of work is creating national attention. We're getting hundreds of millions of views, tweets, comments, and shares on the social platforms and starting these discussions. We have to have that conversation out there and seeding it with really good content. So to sum up the three important points, to reach Latinos, make sure that you have the infrastructure and the people in place. We'd like to see that. Make sure your program and the experience that you're creating is relevant to them and communicate and invite us. If you don't invite us to come, we're not gonna just show up. So you gotta communicate to us in that culturally competent way. Speak culture, not just language. I said, speak to us in a culturally competent way. I didn't say speak to us in Spanish. In some cases, it may be in Spanish. In some cases, it might be in English. And the last question is, how many of you in here are going to go from taking notice to taking action? Uh, that's a great talk, Carlos. Uh, spot you. on. Um, I'm going to toss the first um, question to Jerry because I think, uh, you know, representing the uh, hospitality industry and our particularly our park concessioners, um, and and Carlos makes a very strong business argument uh, about the buying power uh, of 
this growing generation. Um, what, what's DNC doing and what advice would you give to the rest of the concessioners and our um, business community that they should be doing to connect? Well, I, I like the reference to speaking culture uh, more than language. And we do emphasize, uh, and we do feel that America is sort of moving in the direction of a bilingual nation. But that doesn't really address um, you know, what we're talking about here in terms of making uh, parks visits uh, meaningful to, to the Latino community. Um, what we've begun to really try is, is to focus on hiring um, a, a demographic that reflects the nation. So um, getting the right proportion of, uh, of, of all elements of our diversity into our uh, employee base and, and directors, you know that's not so easy when you're trying to tell, move people to a valley floor and have them live in a tent. So there are a lot of, uh, of, of difficulties around that. But that is the direction we feel we need to move. Uh, and we also feel that there are, um, you know, there are unique opportunities to connect with different um, elements of, 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 our, of, of our community uh, that, that are based more around their cultural heritage and their, and, and their connection. Uh, with these parks and then to translate that into as we said sort of that connection that transcends so that the national parks are, are an American asset and they're, they're, they belong to the citizens of this country and you really need to be have this sense of ownership and, and, and pride in your parks. What I love about the Latino community in, in our own personal experiences is they place such high emphasis on family that when, when they arrive, it's, it's the family. It's the, it's the full family. It's brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandma, grandpa. And those kind of special um, memories, again, I go back to the next generation, but those memories that are created in, with those kids is just going to strengthen um, the future constituency for our parks. I mean, heck, you guys are already moving elections, so <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a reality we have to face. And, and we see it as a great opportunity. Um, and from a business perspective, uh, and as a, as a responsibility, as a duty, uh, as a concessioner in our parks. That's great. Okay, okay good. <laughs> I mean, it's again, it's Did I do good? No, okay. I mean, you, you, you're saying all the right things. I think the, the hard part is, as you've said, is getting, getting uh, staffed up the right way. I understand that can be a, a real challenge, but I think it's smart for you to be thinking that that's the important first step that you need to do. Stephanie, um, I know uh, we've been working with you at the Trust uh, about uh, new designations uh, for National Register, National Historic Landmarks, so sort of stemming from the American Latino uh, Heritage Study that we did um, uh, with great assistance from the Trust. Uh, any thoughts about sort of building that cultural competency through this uh, effort to designate new sites and tell more stories? So. Yeah, uh, Carlos talked about inviting us in. And one of the things that we've tried to do at the National Trust is to make sure that the work that we're doing is inviting to people. So that I, I've said to our staff, if anybody looks at our website, I want them to see their people represented in the work that we do. And I think we had that opportunity, John, also within, within the parks to make sure that we're elevating these stories that we know are, are resident here, but may not always be top of line messaging at our parks um, so that we can make sure that those stories are being told. It's a more welcoming environment if you see your people and your people's history represented. I also wanted to note that in some of the market research that we've done at the National Trust, there are a lot of people in that millennial generation who care about preservation. Mm -hmm. And they are as diverse as the United States. And that's a beautiful thing. There's just a, there is a tremendous opportunity for us. But we need to elevate these stories. We need to invite people in because they're getting invited in by a lot of different, a lot of different organizations. Ken, um, I know as a part of uh, our centennial campaign, we have some efforts to um, connect and resonate, build relevancy within the Latino community. You want to comment a bit about that? Sure. Uh, you know, I think... One of the things we've been very mindful of from the start is we certainly have been focused on multicultural, but we're mindful, and I think Carlos hit this right on the head, is it's not what's the campaign and what's the multicultural part of it. Uh, when we talk about millennials, you talk about this next generation, um, they self-identify themselves as multi-ethnic, okay? So you don't have to wait until 2050 
the dominant ethnicity that they identify themselves as is Hispanic. So we have to recognize that in all of our communications, as Carlos was saying, and not, it's not just translating and having Hispanic language stuff, but it's recognizing the cultural experience. It's recognizing, um, you know, what they're looking for and playing that back with that, that level of invitation, you know? And I think it's a very different perspective than, uh, you know, we've taken in the past. I think we, we tend to think about uh, multicultural as something as almost like a bolt-on instead of the core focus of what we need to do. So a lot of our campaign has been built from day one with that as a mindset in the research we did, the strategic development and the, the quantitative testing that we did so that we didn't end up with a campaign or a message that was really cool and resonant for this group of people and how do we translate it. We set out to make sure it was relevant from a multicultural aspect in, in the totality of what we call total market. And I think that was a huge um, shift in the mindset of how we were doing the communications and really I think how the Park Service is looking to talk to this generation of people. Okay, thanks, Ken. John, I, um, and I, I'm going to sort of ask a question that's both for you and, and Carlos, but um, I heard a statistic recently, and it, it's not surprising, but in a way uh, very important that most Hispanics get their information from English media, English-speaking media, not Spanish-speaking media, and that we have this tendency to say, well, we've got to get whatever we're doing in the media on Spanish language, radio or television, but reality, it's more about culture and than it is about language. Take a shot at that. Uh, you know, I don't know that I want to. <laughs> to be just to be fair, I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know enough uh, enough about it. But but it sort of leads into the question I had for Carlos, um, if I could be so eloquent as to completely sidestep your question. Uh, Go for it. Thank you. But uh, is there enough diversity? I mean, if you were ever to make an argument for a market, you, you made it eloquently in eight minutes or less. I mean, that's it, right? If you were, you know, people were running to China, we're running overseas, we're running everywhere. There's a pretty significant market that you just did in, in, in 12 slides, right? It's right there. Is, are you having trouble with that message? Because I, I, fr frankly, I was shocked by some of the numbers, right? It's a pretty significant market sitting right outside our door here. So mm -hmm. we either get on planes and we go overseas and go and do and all that, which is all the things we should do, by the way. I'm not, I'm not saying that these things have to be bifurcated by any such. But is there a challenge with this? Is it people are not getting it? Is there enough, are there enough Latinos in the, in the, in the community that, that's marketing this to understand the significance of this opportunity? Oh, boy. You want to open up a can of worms there. Let's see. Where <laughs> should I start? Um, no, I think that what we have is uh, a multifaceted challenge. Um, first, you have a, a fear of the unknown, right? Oh, it's those people. Right? I still have conversations with people that use that term. They say to me, well, I don't know about working with those people. And I keep saying, wait, I'm standing right in front of you, man. Mm -hmm. Why do you keep saying those people? Mm -hmm. You mean me? Um, so there's a fear of the unknown from some folks that still haven't gotten it, that they know it's there, they see the numbers, but they're not quite sure what to do about it. So there's that. There's the fear of the unknown. There's budget. There's always a fight for budget, always. How do we make this work? And so what Ken said that's so important is stepping back for a minute and not saying, well, this should be a carve-out for the African-American, a carve-out for Hispanic, a carve-out for Asian but really look, taking a total market approach. Mm -hmm. So how do we do this and we invite everybody in and you're, you're more inclusive? Um, and, and, and so, and the third thing is just the challenge of finding the expertise to go out and do it. So a friend, uh, good friend of mine, Ralph De La Vega is the CEO of AT&T Wireless. When he took over AT&T Wireless, they were number four in the market with Latinos in terms of wireless um, use. This is back uh, eight years ago. And he said, why are, we number, why are we number three? I don't understand what's going on. And he went into the markets and he realized in places like South Central and East LA, he said, we should, be, we should be in this market. And they were, but he was in there with resellers. 
So he said, no, I want to put company-owned stores in these places, but we've got to hire people from the community to work in here. We've got to put signage in here that works bilingually. Okay, we've got to create an experience and programs that will work. A few years later, they became the number one, the number one provider of, 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 of wireless service to Latinos. Why? Because he took that model and he applied it around the country. So it's kind of a combination of factors that people need to see uh, happen and line up before they go from, okay, what Carlos just said is great, to I can see the, the success at the bottom line. And to answer your question, because I just feel like talking. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, you have an important question. Your question was about the consumption of media. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, not to oversimplify, but I will tell you, it's sort of like 25-50-25. 25% of the market is English only, 50% is bicultural and bilingual, and 25% is, is Spanish preferred mm. or Spanish reliant. So when you look at those numbers, you can basically say 75% of the population is probably rather watch Brian Williams or um, they might tune into a little bit of Jorge Ramos on Univision, but they're not relying on Spanish language media to get their primary source of information. Okay. Does that help? Jump? Yeah. We have done some uh, focus group studies and, 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 and reached out to the Hispanic community. And, one of the interesting things to me is we did, I did agree on the culture thing, but to the extent we, we, we have uh, employees that, that, that speak Spanish or uh, we translate um, you know, menus or, or maps uh, or interpretive programs, um, it sends a message that to, to the Hispanic community that, I, hey, I'm welcome here. Um, they want me here, and this is, you know, so I think there, there was sort of that sense that this is sort of, you know, this, this isn't our, our thing, that's, that's, that's their thing. And when we, when we do go the extra step for the translation and the interpretation, it, it sends a message. It's not necessarily cultural, but it does send a message that we want their business and we want them to be there and we welcome them. So. One of our clients is uh, Regal Entertainment, the largest movie theater chain in the country, and we're redoing their entire menus because they realize that 26% of their ticket sales, 26% of their ticket sales are going to Latinos. Not 15%, which is what we represent in this country. 26% of their ticket sales are going to Latinos, so their menus need to be reflective. They're not changing, we're not redesigning and changing what their offerings are. We're just taking a look at what's there to leverage the fact that there could be an opportunity to be, do some more upselling inside of the movie theaters. John, can I, can I add something to this conversation? And it goes back to the question you asked earlier about the National Latino Heritage Initiative and this notion of inviting people in. One of the, the things that we've learned over time is that there are certain segments of our society, and they are growing, that are underrepresented in the formal preservation movement. Their heritage has not gotten as much recognition as uh, Western European heritage just to be, put a fine point on it. And if we want to welcome these audiences in, we need to welcome them into the formal, the, the formal um, constructs that we have, not just the informal constructs, such as um, interpretation and, and, and those kinds of things. And I think this is really important because we are, we are seeing, as Dave talked about a few minutes ago, the National Park Service registers with people because it is, it is iconic their heritage needs to be represented within that iconic context or that iconic construct. And it isn't as well represented as it is today. So I want to give, just recognize uh, Director Jarvis and the work that the Park Service has been doing to elevate national Latino heritage, but also Asia Pacific Islander, women's history, other represented groups, because that's what makes people feel welcome when they see themselves and their stories represented. And, and they're there. We just need to do more in order to bring them to the surface. You know, one comment, um, you know, I spent all day in uh, San Antonio uh, with the community, Latino community there, and that, you know, much of the preservation movement stems from a sense of loss, uh, and the loss of the Univision building was uh, very, very devastating to a lot of the community, and, uh, and that has galvanized support uh, to, uh, to move to protect sites that are important to, uh, to our, all of our history. Uh, but particularly important to the Latino community as well. So, 
Good. Any, um, just open it up, any other comments or questions you might have, uh, comments on this topic with, you know, I, with I Carlos? One thing I just really want to emphasize that Carlos hit on, you know, for everybody in this audience, when you think about how to talk to this um, group and really the entirety of who we're talking to, which is millennials, multicultural, et cetera, he, the point he made about getting to them through the internet, social media, cannot be emphasized enough, okay? This is a cohort of people that consume media very differently. So we can't just think, well, I'm gonna even have a total market strategy, but I'm gonna go do print ads, or I'm gonna go run on the nightly news or something like that. You have to create a conversation with them, okay? which is a new thing for a government entity to create a two-way conversation with a target group. And that's something we're gonna have to come to grips with because whether it's multicultural or just millennials in general, they want to be able to provide that feedback. They want to be a part of this brand. So we need to have that openness. We need to communicate in the channels that they're used to communicating through and make sure we have that consistent presence. You know, a lot of the work we're doing is very centennial based, right? We're gonna talk about that in a few minutes, but it can't end in 2016, okay? From the Park Service, the foundation, all of you folks here, that conversation needs to continue on and continue on in those right channels, or it's gonna be a lot of effort to celebrate a birthday party and everyone's gonna go home. So I just really wanna make sure that that point is emphasized. Okay. Well, thank you, Carlos. Thank Excellent. You. We're going to wrap this up. <laughs>